Lighting a candle in the darkness helps us find our way. In darkness, we lose direction. We cannot see where we have been or where we are going. A single candle flickering brightly helps us find our way. Stir up your mighty cup to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Psalms 8, Psalm 80, 2 through 3. We light this candle as a sign of our hope, our joyous hope that we can be restored, our faith restored, our strength restored, our confidence restored, our joy restored as we watch and wait with all God's people for the promise to be fulfilled. Light one candle, see it glow, brightly so that all may know how one candle shows the way, making our darkness as bright as God's day. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Let us pray. Dear God, on this first Sunday in Advent, let this light shine brightly as the days grow shorter, so that we will be ready for your face to shine upon us at Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning again. God is good all the time. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. We're in the month or the the season of Advent. Um, In our series in the book of Mark, we are at the crucifixion. I didn't feel it was appropriate to paint the crucifixion and the incarnation of our Lord Jesus come to earth at the same time. (laughs) So we're just going to take this next five weeks and look at the Advent. Each week, we will begin with our Advent wreath. We will have the same uh, approach, and then we're going to highlight the themes of hope, the themes of peace, the themes of joy, and the themes of love. Before our Christmas program, um, a, a wonderful time. This year, Christmas is actually on Sunday, um, and so we will have a special time of just worshiping God during that time. I just want to say Christmas time is a, is a, is a blessed season. Um, But I am well aware uh, of the suffering that is also intertwined with Christmas when families are separated or loved ones are separated or you can't be where you would desire or want to be. And thence, hence the beautiful opportunity that we get to come and gather to give God the glory due to his name collectively as God's children, as sons and daughters of his that Christmas doesn't become about a situation or a circumstance, but about a person. With that, we enter into the first week of Advent, hope. Where and what do we lie in our hope for? Oftentimes, Christmas starts the week after Thanksgiving as we're here today. In our household, you're not allowed to listen to Christmas music before then. (laughs) And and that's when it starts, right? And and then we start adorning our houses with nativity scenes, and we get an evergreen tree and put it in our living room. I mean, the Christmas tree is really cool, but the concept of it is just like it's weird. Like we, we take a tree from outside and bring it into our house. Anyhow. We will do that on Monday. Um, We typically do it the day after Thanksgiving, but Thanksgiving got really busy this year. Um, And 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 what is the reasons we do that? Why do the the reason for the season? Right? What is the reason for the season? Do you know where that term came from? We started to add the the this phrase and and get bumper stickers and T-shirts, and we start to say the reason for the season because everywhere we turn, Christ is being removed from the world. And you know what? This shouldn't surprise us. We stand in like an offense, you know, you know, but we shouldn't be offended. They're they're coming against 
our Lord and our Savior the same way they came against Him since His birth. This is not a new concept. Around the world, there are places where you can't talk about Jesus. You can't walk around with a Bible. And and today, with smartphones, nobody's an excuse for not having a Bible because they're free. And if they're not free, you go to a church and pick one up and they're above our mailboxes and you, you take it home with you. So we shouldn't be surprised that we coined a phrase, a reason for a season, because we have this hope that is more than any adversity within our lives or within our beings. So if we look at this word advent, it comes from a Latin word that means coming. And and up until the sixth century before that, advent was celebrated, but it was celebrated at times of baptism. As times of renewal within the church. And then after the 6th century, Advent became something that, that the people observed. But, but they didn't observe the, the Advent the way we observe it today. Do, do you know what they observed? They observed the second coming of Christ after the 6th century. And then sometime later, in the medieval times, they started to observe Advent the way we do, as the coming of Christ, looking back at the incarnation of our Lord. We are waiting for the coming of Jesus to come again to restore his church. But we also take this time to observe what it was like for them to wait for the consolation of Israel. And so we enter into this theme of hope. So you can't talk about hope without saying, well, how is hope described? And, and if faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen, I would suggest that hope is something that we don't yet have possession of. Because you can't hope for things that you already have. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait patiently for it. That's what the scripture says. John Piper said it like this. Hope is a confident expectation. It does not simply imply uncertainty or the lack of insurance. Instead, biblical hope is a confident expectation and desire for something good in the future. Now, some of the parents in here will understand what I'm talking about because kids right now are waiting eagerly for December 25th, the morning of December 25th, because they are eagerly anticipating that everything they circle in the consumer magazine is going to be underneath a tree on that morning. Will some of those expectations be let down? <laughs> Absolutely, because if you ever see the ridiculousness of the circles. But there's a hope, right? There's an eager anticipation that when Christmas morning arrives, I can go downstairs and find yada, 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 yada. But hope that I'm talking about isn't that. It's eternal. It's an eternal hope that we are waiting for the second coming of Christ. So in that idea of, of that, we need a complete overhaul of our expectations of what we're hoping for and are we hoping in somebody. Second Corinthians says, for this light monetary affliction we are preparing is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comprehension. Wow. This hope is beyond our comprehension. That is a hope that we can eagerly wait for if it's beyond your comprehension. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's what I'm trying to drive home. Our hope in the Advent 
Our hope in the coming of Jesus Christ. The hope that Jesus Christ is coming in all glory to redeem us back to Himself. But in order to go there, I need to I need to go back a little. Um, did I just? There we go. I need to go back a little. See, before sin, God walked with Adam and Eve of the day in the garden. There was no need for this, this word hope. They were secure. They walked with God. But then sin enters. And when sin enters, peace with God is disrupted. Peace with God is the only real existence of peace. Let me say that again. Peace with God is the only real existence of peace. Anything else is generic. Anything else is made up. It may sound good, but it won't fulfill. And it won't last. Only the promises of God, especially the hope of Christ's coming, will be fulfilled. Anything else that we take in, all the data that we store up in our hearts that we hope in, will fade and let us down. Let me elaborate. God peacefully walks in the garden with all of His creation. He walks amongst Adam. He walks amongst Eve. He walks with the beast of the fields and the birds of the air and the creepy things. I meant the creeping things that are creepy. I don't know how he walks with the fish of the sea. I don't know. Does he swim with the fish of the sea? But he, the idea is he is with all of his creation. This is peace with God. At this point in the story, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, they have not experienced darkness. And God told them, do not eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And well, what happens? They, like a lot of us, want to be masters of our own fate. I'm guilty. I want to rule and reign my life. And when I want to rule and reign my life, I take steps into darkness and, and the peace with God becomes disrupted. I can't have peace with God and live any way I want to live. I can't walk in sin and disobedience and expect peace. I cannot have wronged somebody without making it right and sleep right at night. And this is the conviction of God. When God is calling us back to Him, is that conviction that something is wrong and that something is wrong is... I. It, my relationship is disrupted. Adam and Eve, like a lot of us, have chosen through a decision the path of death. Because there's only two paths. Life and death. And every choice and every decision we make is pointing in one of those two directions. But the beautiful thing about Adam and Eve is that fruit that tasted so good had a really bad aftertaste. Had, a, had such a bad aftertaste that they had to look back to God who instills in them hope. God instills hope. The final revelation. Of Jesus Christ, our hope will be satisfied. And we will no longer hope. 
But until then, and in this garden, after sin, God promised Satan eternal doom. God promised Satan eternal doom. He cursed the ground and he increased labor pains and gave women labor pains. In that curse, in that curse, God promises us something. In his creation. And God defines hope not in a thing, not in a thought, not in an idea. God defines hope in a person. And I hope you all know who I'm talking about. The reason we gather, the reason for the season, to give God the glory due to his name through Christ Jesus because we have this hope. And it said like this, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In a nutshell, there's a now a spiritual battle from this moment on in history. Before peace was disruptive, it was walking with God. After this disruption becomes the knowledge of good and evil. And a battle wages on where we need discernment and wisdom that only comes through Christ. Satan is real and his desire is to distort everything good. Satan brings chaos and confusion and separation. And most importantly, he is an enemy of God. So God put enmity between our hope our future so that we can be redeemed through Christ Jesus in the death and resurrection of our Lord. Enmity. A noun meaning enmity. I think love when dictionaries do that, right? But it goes on. Admosity, hostility, blood feud. A feeling or condition of hostility, hatred, ill will, animosity, antagonism, the feeling one naturally has toward an enemy. The battle is real. When you were in this battle, and you are, the enemy is trying to destroy every fabric of peace that you have with God. That's what he's trying to destroy. He is the author of idolatry. Everything that is at odds with God. And that's what he desires of you. So we so desperately need hope. Which is the latter part of this verse. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This word shall bruise suggests an incomplete future action. Something that has not yet happened at this time. It could also mean strike or crush. So from the beginning of the fall... The author and creator, our maker, our God, instills hope. I don't know if this hope would have been translated that well as the person of Jesus that we can now today look back at and go, oh, that's what happened. That's what this means. Because as the snake was cursed to crawl 
on his belly. Satan will strike low at Jesus' feet. And he will strike from behind. That's a cowardly move, correct? Bruising Jesus' heel. That's where we're at in the book of Mark right now, by the way. If you're coming and you're following, this week would have been the crucifixion. But this man, Jesus, will strike the serpent's head, which implies that Jesus will deliver to Satan the final death blow, which is what Jesus accomplished. So before God ever pronounced judgment on Adam and Eve, listen to this, before he cursed Adam and Eve, he went to the deceiver and pronounced him dead and told him that a unique man will come out of this woman's seed and we have the first Christmas story. The first Christmas promise. Jesus would be wounded. Amen. Hallelujah. For our sins and our transgressions. Jesus would accept that, but he would not be defeated. Isaiah says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. My theologian friends, do you know that this is called the first gospel? Genesis 3.15. Because this is when God responds with redemption and hope. This is where God gives us a hint of the incarnation that Jesus will come out of a woman. This is where we, we hear about affliction and the crucifixion. And within this one verse, there's a hint of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. In the advent of Jesus' incarnation, we have this hope. Listen. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is also called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Jay, you can begin the process of letting the children come back. So, in conclusion, as we get toward the end, at the lowest point of creation, the fall, God shows up and instills hope. In your lowest area of life, God has the power to instill hope in you through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
in my story, in my lowest, homeless on the streets of Philadelphia, hungry, cold, withdrawing from heroin, with nowhere to go, with no belief in God, I cried out, God, if you're real, save me. At that moment, I was hopeless. Without hope, with no peace, with no rest. And Christ was revealed to me. And it was like the light switch was turned on and I walked into the light of God for the first time. And for the first time in my existence, I experienced hope. And I'm telling you, those first three months in prison, you couldn't wipe the smile from my face because of the hope that I had in Christ. This hope was revealed to the Old Testament prophets like this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressors, you have broken as in the day of meeting. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle Talmud and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, for the, this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In Romans, the God of peace will soon cross Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Rejoice. As we look at the second coming, at not look at it, as we live in the second coming of Christ, where we eagerly wait for this promise that was just read to you to be fulfilled. Soon Satan will be crushed under his feet and Christ will come. Our hope, as we looked at the first advent, was, was of Jesus coming, the incarnation of our Lord and Savior. But we live in attention now of waiting, eagerly waiting. And I pray that as you declared this morning that God was good, that you eagerly wait for his coming. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. May the hope of God's peace, joy, and love rest upon you. For these latter three words mean nothing unless we have hope. Let's pray. Jesus, be glorified. Help us this Christmas season look back at the promises. Look to when you came, Lord. And look to when you are coming back. Be glorified in and through us.
Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.